Uh, thank you. So um, I just want to recall um, last time we had um, said that to count cubic rings, so maximal orders in cubic number fields were examples of cubic rings, um, and those were the things we wanted to count in the end, maximal orders in cubic number fields to count the cubic number fields themselves. Um, but to do that, we, uh, we can count cubic rings, and then it, at the end, uh, there's a sieve to make sure that you um, only get um, the cubic rings that are maximal, so maximal orders. And that sieve, actually, it's, it's similar in spirit to a lot of the sieves we've seen, so I'm not going um, not gonna to say um, much about that in the talk. Um, so to count cubic rings, we need to count GL2Z classes of binary cubic forms, so of these forms here. So we just write down four integers A, B, C, D, and then um, there are GL2Z classes of those quadruples given uh, by an action that I wrote down yesterday, which is almost just like acting on the X and Y. Um, we want to count these up to discriminant X asymptotically in X. You could ask, well, what is the discriminant um, of, of such a binary cubic form? And actually, I think that it's very close to the formula that Jordan wrote down in his talk for the discriminant of the cubic. There's just, uh, it's homogeneous uh, with, say, using the leading coefficient and so forth. So it's basically the same idea as the discriminant of a cubic polynomial. Um, so we want to count these up to discriminant x. So today, in this last lecture, I have two goals. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about how this happened. How it happened that to count cubic rings, all we had to do with, was this. Now, actually, I gave you a completely concrete um, uh, proof of that uh, by just writing down the multiplication table. But I think it's a little magical. So I'm going um, uh, uh, to, to, to first try to say a little bit about why this magic happened, why it worked out so nicely um, that all we had to do uh, was, was count these classes, and then the second goal is to say a little bit about the tools that go into counting the classes. All right. So, um, oh. so to talk about why this um, magic happened, as I suggested uh, last time, if you have any binary inic form, so here um, now. Instead of necessarily taking a cubic form, I could take um, a higher degree, but still homogeneous in two variables, x and y. So any such form um, gives, um, defines via its zero locus a sub, um, a subspace, a subscheme of the projective line over the integers, which in general might look sort of like this. So that's that picture there, that's VF, that's where F equals zero. Um, now I'm drawing these pictures where, um, say, the integers look like a curve. And we, in this, this uh, winter school, we've had a lot of discussion about the number field function field analogy. So I want to be clear that here, the analogy is sort of inspiring these pictures. But I am, I am literally talking about um, things on the number field side here. There's nothing on any function field side. Um, uh, these, the objects that I'm interested in are, um, are rings of, of, of integers and number fields. And uh, if you're not already convinced, I hope um, that, that this is, uh, is, is somewhat convincing that even if you only cared about the number field case, being able to understand the number theoretic objects as geometric objects, being able to understand spec Z, which is a geometric, a one-dimensional geometric object that corresponds uh, to the integers, is actually a really useful uh, point of view. Even, even if you, like I am today, are just interested in, in number fields and not function fields. So 
Here, um, uh, in this uh, in this picture, I said that we we could get out of out of this thing we get a um, we get a Rankine ring. So if I take global functions, so if I take global functions uh, on VF, which you might write like this, um, uh, that this is rank in ring. So I'm thinking of often as an order um, in a, a sort of typical example is an order in a number field uh, of degree n. Okay, and so um, uh, I want to draw the picture of what that um, that Rankine ring would look like, so I'll call this Rankine ring RF. That Rankine ring is going to look kind of like this, where I'm making these points. These are these are singularities. Uh, these are singularities. So that that here is the picture of of um, of spec RF, which is the geometric object that corresponds to this. Which in this in this this is a picture of the case where this really would be an order in a number field. So um, these uh, where this curve here hit the um, hit these vertical fibers, um, the global functions have have these have these singularities. And so this explains in a very geometric way um, uh, things that are happening. Like I said, entirely uh, for rings of integers. Now it's actually it turns out even for the original problem to count uh, the GL2Z classes, it's actually important to understand um, somewhat the singular things. Um, and so that's why I drew that picture. I want to give them some time. But now, I'm just for simplicity, uh, for the purposes of the talk, um, I'm going to just imagine the case where the coefficients of the binary form don't have any common divisor. And so then the picture looks like this. Um, and here, the, the zero locus of my binary form is actually literally the, the geometric object that corresponds uh, to the rank. This is all in C1. Okay, so this is literally um, the the geometric object that corresponds um, uh, to the ring. All right. So I said I said that for any n, you get such a construction. So what's special about three? What was the magic of three? All right. Well, if I have any say rank in ring, maybe you should even think right maximal order in degree and number field um, R. So maybe you're thinking of R as like, OK. There is always a geometric object here. There's always um, a, a geometric object associated to it. But it's not clear that, uh, that, that this ab sort of abstract one-dimensional object embeds in P1 over Z. So that this, cur I mean, this, this is, some, this is a, a sort of surface, because there's the Z dimension and the P1 dimension. So it's literally P1 over Z is this two-dimensional thing. And it's not always the case that this, uh, that this um, one-dimensional thing will, will actually sit inside of P1, um, this two-dimensional thing, right? It's, it's two-dimensional because it's P1, and the Z uh, contributes a dimension. Um, OK, now just to think of an analogy for a minute, um, if you have, say, curves over the complex numbers, right? Um, all curves embed in some projective space, but they don't all embed, in, embed nicely in P2, right? So, some curves. Uh, some smooth curves are, you know, live they live their lives in smooth plane curves, but not all of them. Um, some of them need 
need more space to, to, to fit into. Um, and if you know anything about, about um, curves, so you know actual geometric curves, say over the complex numbers, they always embed somewhere. In particular, they have a canonical embedding. So turns out these, these objects have a canonical embedding as well. So um, spec, RF, so this, this geometric object has a canonical embedding. So in some P in, okay? And so if, um, so if I have a map to PN, so what, what is a map, a map from something to projective space? Okay. Uh, so more generally, what is a map from something to projective space? The data of such a map uh, should be a line bundle on the original space and um, sections, how many, well, I should maybe here, and n plus one sections of said bundle that are base point three or nowhere all vanishing. Okay. So these are things, um, th these are ideas that of course, like you might first learn about in the context of really geometric algebraic geometry over the complex numbers, but the nice thing about the construction of schemes is that these things all literally make sense on spec RF. Um, and here, in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, algebraic language, such a line bundle corresponds to an element of the class group of RF. So that's just an ideal, and the sections then are just elements of the ideal. You know. So the line bundle is an element of the class group, and that's, that's a, represented by some ideal, and then you could take elements of the um, ideal. Uh, and so, so in this case, the canonical embedding um, of spec RF. So if somebody said, okay, give me a canonical um, element of the class group, well, perhaps your first guess would be um, uh, the trivial element, because that's in all the class groups. But that, that, that turns out to be uh, well, a little too trivial. Um, and there's probably, I mean, there's only one other uh, there's sort of only one other ideal that, um, that every ring has, and that's given, so the canonical embedding is given by the ideal class of the inverse different. Okay, so really maybe you could say there are two ideals that every uh, ring has, the different and the inverse different. Um, and the inverse different is actually much more natural, like despite the unfortunate terminology. Um, and so, so that's, that's the canonical bundle, um, uh, the canonical line bundle on spec RF. And, um, uh, and the question is, uh, so how many, how many sections do you need so they are nowhere all vanishing? So that controls this in here, okay? Um, and it turns out that in general, uh, you need to take n minus one, okay? Oh, sorry, that sorry, little n, little n minus one sections to get nowhere all vanishing. So if I have a cubic ring. And I take spec of it, the geometric object there, so there n is three, so I have two sections, so I get a map to P1 in general for every cubic ring. So that's why every cubic ring, um, modulo some, 
some technical details, but, that, but that's the, the main reason that every cubic ring arises in this way. So for every n, there are some, um, um, for every n, there are uh, some, some Rankine rings that sit in P1. You should think about that, um, you know, for every, well, it's not actually true for every genus, but for every, um, uh, every degree, right? I mean, there are, there are some curves that are plain curves, um, but, uh, but, but not all of them. And so, so in general, if you want um, to, to see where, where your quartic rings live, this, the spectrum of a quartic ring in general lives in P2, and the spectrum of a quintic ring lives in P3, et cetera. Um, and that's why it gets it more and more complicated in general to parameterize quartic rings, quintic rings, uh, et cetera. So um, maybe I'll just make a remark. So right, for every n, you know, some spec RF of degree n do embed in P1. We've seen them there coming from, um, coming from binary anic forms. Um, and these are actually, um, these, these are particularly nice, um, uh, nice sort of rank in rings or, you know, um, orders. For example, orders in degree and number field. So you should think of these as the, the analogy is to plane curves, all right? Um, not all cur smooth curves can be realized as smooth plane curves, but uh, the ones that can, there are a lot of things that we can do with plane curves explicitly that we can't, that, that you can't do um, uh, for, for general um, curves, and so these, um, yeah, so these are, so when a number field has its maximal order actually sitting in P1 of Z, those are particularly nice examples. So just as a sample, um, for, for these nice, uh, uh, these nice number fields where say their maximal order um, actually sits inside of P1, uh, we have this kind of explicit parameterization for their class groups. So I just gave you the parameterization of cubic uh, number fields. And another thing you might want to parameterize, if you want to do some of this aris arithmetic statistics to count, is parameterize class groups. And so I will just very briefly say that GL2Z cross GLNZ cross GLNZ orbits of cross CN. So these in a very similar spirit. So these parameterize class groups of these uh, RF that sit inside of, 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 of P1, okay? So um, uh, for every n, the, um, the, the Rankine rings that sit inside of P1 are nice, and the point is that when n equals three, so all cubic rings are this nice. And um, that, in a lot of ways, was um, uh, responsible for this magic um, that, that we could write down um, a cubic ring just in terms of these four parameters, A, B, C, and D, which we saw pretty transparently with the multiplication table but it, it, it might sort of seem to, to, come from, to come from nowhere. So that's, um, so that's where that's coming from. So now I want to say, well, now that we have uh, appreciated um, this magic, so how do we count, count the GL2Z orbits of A, B, C, D? Um, so, 
um, these uh, parameters a, b, c, d, they're integers. So we've got a, a z to the fourth, so a four-dimensional lattice of a, b, c, d's. Um, but we don't want to count all of them. We only want to count one in each GL2Z class. So we need a fundamental domain. They call it F for the action of GL2Z. And so, um, okay, I'll draw some kind of picture. This is, okay, well, First of all, I'm only going to draw a two-dimensional picture, not a four-dimensional picture. Um, uh, anyway, so you've got your lattice, and then the, the uh, property that um, a fundamental domain has, so if this is, say that, so this is supposed to be the fundamental domain F, is that each, each orbit has, um, exactly one lattice point in F. So um, I hope that in your life you've seen at least uh, one fundamental domain, um, uh, this one, right? Um, so which has a very similar, um, very similar spirit. Each, each SL2Z orbit of the upper half plane has one point in this region, so this is like that. Actually, this might have even been a better picture. This, this is, in, in some important sense that maybe I'll, I'll mention, this is very much the same fundamental domain, except that's a little confusing because this one should be in four dimensions. But um, uh, anyway, so, um, so once you have a fundamental domain, now counting GL2Z orbits of A, B, C, D is just a question of counting lattice points um, in the region. So we've got, we've got some region. Here's my F. Oh, sorry, that's that's a pretty bad lattice. <laughs> okay, it should be a little slower. Okay, so we want to count <laughs> lattice points in just some in some region F. Now, let's remember what we we're, we're not counting all of them. The answer: How many lattice points are in that region? It's infinitely many. Yes, there are infinitely many cubic rings. What did we want to do? We wanted to count them up to discriminant x and understand that asymptotically in x. So I don't want to count all the lattice points in F. I need to, to draw my boundary, say here, you know, say this is like the discriminant sort of equals X line. And so I just want to count the ones on, on, on this side. So I don't want to count lattice, all of the lattice points in X. I want, want to count them um, inside of the discriminant less than or equal to X. So this was supposed to be discriminant, you know, a less than x. So I want to count lattice points in this part of my fundamental domain, and I want to understand that count asymptotically as x increases. So this region um, goes. So, so the region, you know, the discriminant boundary of my region is growing. So here, um, so geometry of numbers sort of describes the field uh, that one is working in if you're counting lattice points in some region. And the, the first example in geometry of numbers, the first example is if you have a region that you're scaling with x. So first um, example is a region um, which, is, which is scaling with x. So you could say, say B is some ball, and then you want to count number of points in B scaled up by X, asymptotically in X. So like some region that's growing in every dimension, everything, just being, um, uh, just being expanded by a factor of X, and, um, and that this is about the um, volume of, of the ball B times X to the dimension. Um, that you're in. So that's the, that's the, the first geometry of numbers that anybody uh, learns. And of course, this goes into a lot of our, this kind of geometry of numbers goes into a lot of the basic um, 
classical theorems in, in, in algebraic number theory, but it doesn't uh, quite apply to this situation because one of the boundaries, this discriminant boundary, is growing in x. But the fundamental domain boundaries, they're just staying put. They are not, they're not expanding um, with x. So we need to do uh, some more sophisticated geometry of numbers. Okay, so say I have, so now I just want to think more generally about what you might expect um, uh, in geometry of numbers. So suppose I have some uh, region R. Um, okay. um, and I want to count lattice points in R. Okay, so let, oh, I like the letter capital N. So I'll let NR be the number of lattice points. Okay, so I hope, I hope that NR um, is about the volume of R, right? That's, that's, a, that's what you sort of expect. You have some region. How many lattice points does it have? It should be about, um, about the volume. And that, you could, in some sense, you could say, because these lines are squiggly, that's always true. The question is just, um, uh, the question is just how good of an approximation is it? I, that's what we really, that we need to know. Like, uh, you, could always, you could call this the main term, and then there's some error term, whatever the difference between these two things is. And how big is the error term? And, Hopefully, if you're interested in some asymptotic, you, you want the error term to be growing more slowly than, than the main term. So, um, you know, how big can, um, can n of r minus the volume of r be? So, um, I think that it's nice to think, there are a lot of examples here that you can think of to kind of convince yourself um, what the story uh, uh, should be here. If, um, you know, if I have, say, some region that's, say, like, um, uh, well, okay, let's say, like, one by A, this could have, basically it could have, could have, so the, so the volume is A. It could have as many as two A points or as few as zero. If my region, say, was not closed on these, on these boundaries, I could have actually zero lattice points. And whether a region is closed on the boundaries or not is, is not something that the volume can see. And that's, that's not really an issue because, you know, this could be 1 plus epsilon or 1 minus epsilon or something. Okay. So, um, so this region has volume A, but it could have as many as 2A points or as few as 0. So if the volume was supposed to be my main term, clearly this is, this is a, um, a, a, not a good region to be doing geometry of numbers in because the error can be uh, can be on this order of A, right, and, you know, sort of more than um, the error can be as big in either direction um, as, uh, as the main term. So you need kind of regions that are, that are big in all, in, in all directions. Um, and so in general, so it's a um, uh, 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 theorem of Davenport, which he uh, proved exactly for this purpose of uh, of counting cubic number fields, uh, that that the um, difference between the number of points in a region and the volume of the region. Um, that, that the error there can be bounded by the size of the projections of the region. Okay, so I'll say more what these things mean. Okay, 
So, um, okay, so this big O is some constant, uh, which it's important to know what it depends on. It depends on sort of the dimension and the degree of the equations defining the boundaries of R, but it doesn't depend very much on the region itself, um, just on these very coarse sort of numerical invariants of R. And so the volume of the projection, so what are these, so by volume of projections, so this is more than one projection. I take the projections of R onto all um, coordinate, um, well, okay, hyperplanes is the wrong word, but I'm going to say hyperplanes first and then I'll be more clear. Um, so you take all the, all the projections of R onto the cor uh, coordinate hyperplanes and you look at their volumes and you can, whatever, you can add them together or take the maximum. And it's, um, uh, uh, and that's an estimate for your error. So here, one way of saying why this region wasn't very good for geometry of numbers is that its volume was A, but it had a projection of size A, which was as big um, as its volume. On the other hand, if you have, um, if you have a region that is, is A by A, then its volume is A squared, and the projections, the biggest projection, is about A, right? And so um, uh, your, your error term is smaller than your main term. So this is a good kind of region to do, uh, to try to count lattice points in. Um, and I'll just make a small point onto all coordinate hyperplanes. So here in two dimensions, I mostly just was, um, I'm thinking about projecting one dimension down. And so this, this all, they're not really, hyper, maybe not really hyperplanes. So of every lower, dimension. So you can see why you need that if you took like a long skinny box that was like, that's sort of 1 by a, say 1 by a, a squared. Um, uh, so this, right, so this has, has volume uh, um, uh, 1, but it's number of points, it could be, right, so it could, if we don't know where the region is located, it could be A squared, it could be centered right around a lattice line, or zero, so we need, we see that the error needs to be at least A squared, so the volume is one, the two-dimensional uh, projections have volumes A, one over, uh, a squared, uh, but then there's a one-dimensional projection that has volume uh, A squared. So that, that this here, in this case, that one-dimensional projection is the biggest thing happening in the error term. Okay, so that's what I, you need all the, um, all the projections to be small. So this theorem of Davenport says that if you have a region um, where the volume um, is, is big, no, so we're doing everything asymptotically in X. So we want our volume to be growing asymptotically in X uh, faster than uh, the volumes of the projections. And then we will asymptotically get uh, an estimate for the number of lattice points. So we, we come back to our, come back to our region, so All right, so this is our fundamental domain, and down here is, is uh, discriminant at most x. Um, and uh, we can ask, so what is the volume of f intersect discriminant at most x? And uh, one, uh, can calculate that, and that is asymptotically a constant times x, okay? Um, and so what's the, the largest volume of a projection for the error term? And uh, 
the answer is, I think, infinity. So that's not the kind of error term that you like to see. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so what this is telling us is that is that our region, I mean, one way to think about it is our region has some sort of long, skinny thing going out somewhere. So maybe that's not the best picture. But maybe the region has some thing going out somewhere where there's not a lot of volume out here, right? The total volume is fine. There's not a lot of volume. But, uh, but I've got my, this sort of cusp of my region. And it might have a lot of lattice points or might not. I can't tell just from geometry of numbers. Because it's really long, like there could just be lattice points actually sitting right down there. Um, and in fact, so, so one nice thing about, the, um, about this problem that actually in some ways makes it easier than just counting GL2Z orbits of binary cubic forms is you know more about those orbits because you actually know they correspond to, um, to cubic rings. And so you can understand some of the orbits in terms of what cubic rings they uh, correspond to. And it turns out that there, there are actually points down this, this uh, uh, skinny cusp here. But you can look and you can figure out what, um, what, what, what points are there. And so there are points here, for example, with a equals 0. So remember, we had um, ax cubed plus bx squared y plus cxy squared plus dy cubed. So when a equals 0, we've got a form like this. And so geometrically, um, when we say, well, where does this vanish? That includes the line x equals 0. So we have some, um, uh, say, some line there, and then we have maybe um, think, so this, so so this is an order in say Q plus K, where this is a quadratic field. So it's got this copy of Q, this this. Uh, component, this copy of, of, of sort of spec Z you're seeing here. So we didn't want those anyway. We were going to get rid of those eventually. We only cared about um, cubic rings that were maximal orders in cubic number fields, not orders in Q plus a quadratic field. So we were eventually going to get rid of those. All right, we just have to do it a little sooner than we might have planned. So there are a lot of uh, points out here. Um, but by going back and using the fact that we understand um, uh, these binary cubic forms, not just as binary cubic forms, but also in terms of what cubic rings they parameterize, we can um, um, determine we didn't want these points anyway. Okay. There's another place there's a lot of points. Okay. Um, so there are also a lot of lattice points with discriminant equal to 0. All right? So those, e.g., correspond to cubic rings uh, like z adjoin x mod x cubed. So I said at the very beginning, those are our, yes, cubic rings, but we didn't want those anyway either. OK, so, um, so now we make a smaller region. So we already had our fundamental domain. We cut off by discriminant less than or equal to x. We're going to sort of add, we're going to add in two more sort of boundaries here, and then we'll only take, only take these points. So this boundary is saying we want, we don't want those a equals 0 points. We want a to be at least 1. And this boundary is saying that we want the discriminant to be at least 1. Um, so we're, 
we are introducing more of these um, uh, boundaries that don't um, homogeneously change, but it's really good for our geometry of numbers because these boundaries uh, uh, cut off some of these long, skinny regions that had huge projections um, and actually turned out to have a lot of points, but they were all points, uh, all points that we, we didn't care about. So now, um, um, this, this is almost you can do now when you analyze this region, almost you can apply uh, Davenport's, um, Davenport's lemma about geometry of numbers. So actually, to be completely honest, Davenport actually has to cut off at something, I forget the exponent, but instead of a at least one, he has to, to cut off at something like this, and then he has to analyze the points. He actually wants some of the points that he has excluded, and he has to analyze that. Um, okay, so Davenport has to, has to, to make a slightly different cut, but basically, um, uh, at this point, you now have a region uh, where you can, where did I, did I write Davenport's theorem? You now have a region where you can apply um, uh, this kind of geometry of numbers estimate and then um, get a good, um, an error term that's at least little o of your big error term uh, for counting the number of, uh, of cubic rings. Okay, so in, so, so that's, so you got the parameterization, you've now, you count the orbits, and um, the last step, like I said, is, uh, is sieving for, for the points that actually corresponded to maximal rings. Um, and uh, you can tell whether an order is maximal by looking at each P one at a time, is it maximal um, at P? For each p, and so you do a sieve over each p. So, like like our square, the square phi sieve, uh, or uh, Bjorn's closed point sieve, it, it um, looks uh, similar. And the really non-trivial part is having some sort of error bound to make sure that your your medium and high degree um, things aren't aren't growing out of control. And so one has to do that, and um, and then um, uh, and then one obtains, for example, I think, you know, so the davenport heilbronn theorem says that the number of cubic number fields up to discriminant x is asymptotically 1 over 3 zeta 3 times x. So that's just a number. Um, so I I uh, want to say, to finish, um, that um, so similar, well, these days, so many um, other similar parameterizations of algebraic objects um, are now known. Um, so I talked about some class groups of um, of 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 certain um, of certain number fields. There are also um, complete parameterizations of of, of quartic and quintic rings with some additional resolvent structure um, due to Margava and um, other parameterizations of class groups and then um, these days also parameterizations of, of related to elliptic curves, some elements of elliptic curves. Um, and, um, and in general, one can, one can apply this, these kinds of geometry of numbers ideas uh, to, to to then count count the objects, um, and I just want to say that that 
in order to um, to make uh, such such a feat actually feasible, um, there has been uh, significant improvement in the in the the geometry of numbers technology from this outline that I gave here, which is essentially how um, Davenport counted points uh, in the region, uh, to the the modern um, geometry of numbers, and that this was so. Um, improvements to geometry of numbers um, basically uh, do to Bargava's work on counting quartic number fields. And I just want to briefly um, uh, briefly say something about um, about the where the improvements come from. Um, so one is a finding a fundamental domain. Okay, so. Da uh, Davenport and Heilbronn uh, wrote down explicitly the boundaries of that region F, um, and um, as you get uh, into more and more complicated parameterizations, writing down those boundaries can get more and more complicated. And so the the idea is that one can use a fundamental domain coming from um, the group. So in this case. You can use a fundamental domain for GL2Z, not on the space of binary cubic forms, but on GL2R. Um, so this actually, if you were going to, I mean, nah, the picture I would draw for a fundamental domain of GL2Z on GL2R like, is this picture, even though, of course, it's still supposed to be four-dimensional. Um, uh, but it's very close uh, to um, the fundamental uh, domain there in, in spirit. And then when you take, say, V0 to be some binary cubic form, essentially applying the fundamental domain um, to, so this is a fundamental domain of group elements. So these are, these are group elements, and you can apply all those group elements to some base point, and you get some region, so you get you get a fundamental domain. Uh, there are some technical issues, but the main idea is that you get a fundamental domain here now for GL2Z on the binary cubic forms. Um, so this this means that once uh, you have a fundamental domain for GL2Z on GL2R, and that's actually incredibly classical. I mean, basically, it's it's this fundamental domain. Um, uh, Any time you've got a parameterization that involves some GL2Z orbits, you can just put you can just push in this same fundamental domain. You don't have to in every problem um, explicitly work out um, a new uh, new fundamental domain. So that's one thing that's nice about that. And the um, um, and the other nice thing is that you can um, choose. different uh, V0, and in particular, you could take a lot of V0 and get a lot of fundamental domains. Um, and um, um, an averaging over these uh, really improves, so it improves the error a lot because when you take a lot of these zeros and each of them makes some fundamental domain, like, um, you know, maybe this V0 makes this domain, this V0 makes this domain, this V0 makes this domain, as you average over all of them, it's uh, sort of like taking your choices of V0s and 
moving them around in the shape of the fundamental domain. And because uh, you get to pick the shape of, um, of, of your sort of choice of these zeros, uh, you, can, you can pick shapes that are really good for geometry of numbers, so that are really kind of ball uh, shaped and not, well, they get kind of long and squishy as they get pushed out here, but not, not as bad as, as the fundamental domain. So um, that has, has been uh, responsible for, a, I mean, a real improvement in the, in the sort of modern technology of geometry of numbers. All right?